Hello, my name is Alethea Black, and I'm grateful to take part in this conference called Does Neuroscience Need a Revolution to Understand Consciousness? I'd like to start with a brief moment for terminology. Many of us associate revolutions with violent power struggles or overthrowing the government, etc., like the French Revolution. But there's another kind of revolution, a quieter, gentler kind, that is both simpler and more powerful. It's the revolution of the still small voice, the little voice that dares to ask questions that challenge some of our most fundamental assumptions. First question, the heliocentric model with the sun at the center. This is the model we have used to describe reality ever since the Copernican revolution in 1543, a hundred years before Isaac Newton. So it's been around a long time. But how can the sun be at the center? We know from cognitive science and from neuroscience that the brain is not a passive observer like a camera lens. The brain actively composes what we perceive. We don't see reality, we see an image. This is not controversial. The way in which perception works is very well studied and well characterized. Neuroscience tells us unequivocally that the brain renders the world. If that's the case, how is the center of the world not the observer? Second question, are we sure the universe is expanding? How might we distinguish a universe that was expanding from an observer who was contracting? Third question, is this an inertial field? In physics, we treat this as an inertial field, meaning in our equations, we assume a baseline of zero. We treat the field as motionless. We do not consider background forces. But is that an accurate assumption? Perhaps the best answer is yes and no. The field is inertial, I believe, but only under certain conditions. Depart from these conditions, and suddenly we have to deal with forces. Perhaps there are always background forces, but we don't always perceive them because they're being held in balance. Is this room freezing? Yes, but we can't tell because we have the heat on. Is this room scorching? Yes, we can't tell because we have the air conditioning. Next question, is this a holographic universe? I don't know, but if it is, Perhaps that will help us to better understand our illnesses. Let's start with Juan Maldacena, the Argentinian physicist involved in studying the holographic principle. Maldacena and others discovered that what looks like a 3D object, a black hole, might be best understood using only two dimensions. Since then, there has been talk about whether everything we perceive might be emerging from two dimensions. So a holographic universe. As a thought experiment, let's think of a flat 2D plane and call it light. This 2D plane is a little like the surface of the ocean. Do we see the entire ocean, the whole plane? I don't think so. I think we see only the region where time intersects with it. So if time is like a giant iceberg, we see only the flat 2D interface where the iceberg and the plane of light intersect. You see what I mean? We have this big iceberg going down and we have this plane of light. And what I'm saying is relevant is this area, this flat disk of intersection here. This flat 2D interface is what I will be calling now. This is our reality. This area contains the information from which what we perceive emerges. For this area here, this limited area, the field is inertial. But remember, this is just an interface. Above it and below it, we have this whole iceberg. And beyond it, we have the whole rest of this plane. Now, who is the observer? Well, I'm interested in the brain in particular the crystal at the center of the brain called the pineal gland. The pineal gland reads light, 
It helps to set the circadian rhythm, and it's the font of the neuroendocrine cascade. If we're talking about the perception of time, we're talking about the pineal gland. Now let's say my brain has not located me here in this flat plane. Let's say my brain has put me a little bit behind or under now. When I'm down here, I'm denser than light. But light doesn't want to be denser than light. Light wants to be light. So when I'm below this interface, when I'm too dense, I have to constantly fight the exploding force. What mineral represents this force? Manganese. It feels to me down here like time is exploding. I need to slow time down, but how? With dopamine. Down here, I fight the perception that time is exploding by making myself more dense. But there's a problem with this solution. The denser light is, the more pressure it's under, the more it explodes. This, I believe, is what we're seeing in the fourth state of matter experiment. When put under extremely high pressure in an extremely confined space, the hydrogen atoms at the center of a water molecule no longer remain in place, but smear out in a ring. So essentially, I'm employing a solution that perpetuates the problem. The tension in my window shade is too high, and it keeps snapping back up whenever I pull it down. So I put a weight on it, so it hangs down at just the right height. That works, but now it has to keep its tension too high. Otherwise, it will unravel all the way. Or let's say my brain has located me a little bit above this plane, a little bit above now. When I'm up here, I'm more diffuse than light. But light doesn't want to be more diffuse than light. Light wants to be light. So when I'm up here, above this 2D interface, I have to constantly fight the condensing force. What mineral represents this force? Iron. It feels to me up here like time is condensing. I need to speed time up, but how? With serotonin. Up here, I fight the perception that time is condensing by making myself more diffuse. But there's a problem with this solution. The more diffuse light is than light, the more it will condense. In other words, in this flat 2D area here, we don't have to deal with forces. But down here, the background force is the exploding force, the centrifugal force. And up here, the background force is the condensing force, the centripetal force. If my brain locates me down here, is that what we call Parkinson's? If my brain locates me up here, is that what we call Lou Gehrig's disease? I don't wanna to have to deal with forces. I want the field to be inertial. I want to be here. So I try to balance the forces. If I perceive the exploding force, if I perceive manganese, I can use its opposite, magnetism, to try to hold myself together. I can use iron, but the more I hoard iron, the more I become denser than light, and the more I feel the exploding force. If I perceive the condensing force up here, if I perceive magnetism, I can use the opposite of magnetism, manganese, to try to hold myself apart. But the more I hoard manganese, the more I make myself more diffuse than light, and so the more I will feel the condensing force. In a manner of speaking, steam wants to return to being water, just as ice wants to return to being water. So I can be too high or too low along this vertical axis, which I'm calling time. What about the horizontal axis here, which I'm calling light? What happens if I've correctly located myself at this altitude, but I'm too dilated? or not dilated enough. If I'm not dilated enough, it's as if I'm too small. My environment is wider than I am. There's a gap 
between me and the world. But I don't want my environment to be wider than I am. I want to be flush with my environment. So what can I use to make myself wider? Intracellular sodium. That works for a while, but there's only so much intracellular sodium one brain can take. Is this involved in chronic fatigue syndrome? Or if I'm too dilated, it's as if I'm too big. I'm actually wider than my environment. I'm getting far more sensory information than I need. I'm actually getting so much sensory information that it hurts me. And I don't want to be wider than my environment. I want to be flush with my environment. So what can I use to make myself smaller? Extracellular potassium. That works for a while, but there's only so much extracellular potassium one brain can take. Is this involved in autism spectrum disorder? These solutions work, technically speaking, but they trap me in a feedback loop of bad information. Once my extracellular potassium is too high, I think the world is wider and higher energy than it really is. So I dilate too much and we're back at square one. Once my intracellular sodium is too high, I think the world is smaller and lower energy than it really is. So I dilate too little and we're back at square one. But we don't see high intracellular sodium in chronic fatigue syndrome. No, we don't because we see an image, an image that's being rendered. I'm rendering myself as too small that I'm making up for it with intracellular sodium. I'm here, but my disc is too little. It has a smaller circumference than this disc. And you can't see that in order for me to be present in now, I have to make myself hypertonic. I have too much intracellular sodium or dark energy. I look like the earth, but I'm actually a swollen moon. You're interpreting me at the scale of the earth. Interpret me at the scale of the moon and you will see my intracellular sodium. Similarly, we don't see extracellular potassium in autism because we see an image. I'm rendering myself as too large, then making up for it with extracellular potassium. I look like the earth, but I'm actually a shrunken sun. You're interpreting me at the scale of the earth. Interpret me at the scale of the sun and you will see my extracellular potassium. So to review, this 2D plane is light. This iceberg is time. Now is the interface where the two meet. Now is a flat disk, but we have to have the right size disk. We can be too dilated, autism, or not dilated enough, chronic fatigue syndrome. Along this axis, we can be behind time and denser than light, Parkinson's, or we can be ahead of time and more diffuse than light, ALS. What I'd really like to talk about today is time. We don't know much about time yet, except that it moves or appears to move. Here's a different way to think about motion, a different way to frame it. Motion needs a floor and a ceiling. The floor, so to speak, is the stationary train. The ceiling is all the points of the track. But can the stationary train and all the points of the track see each other? Perhaps not. Perhaps we can't see past the speeding train. When we're the stationary train, the speeding train is the observer's upper limit. When we are all the points of the track, the speeding train is the observer's lower limit. But will two different observers see the same speeding train the same way? What if we don't see the train as it truly is? We see the way in which it differs from us. From the perspective of the stationary train, it will appear as if the train has speed. From the perspective of all the points of the track, it will appear as if the train has density. This talk is about the brain and the way it composes the images we see. It isn't about the images themselves. 
It's about a way of seeing. When we behold the firmament, are we seeing objective reality or are we seeing the limits of our sight, time's floor and ceiling? In sun and moon, are we seeing the same light, the same train from different directions? Are moon and sun actually just the upper and lower limits of time, like the large and the small end of a ship's spyglass? To our left, we see the rocky planets. To our right, we see the gas giants. Let's try framing celestial bodies a different way, along a density continuum. When I'm denser than light, to get to light, I need speed. When I'm more diffuse than light, to get to light, I need density. But from a health perspective, it's imperative that I accurately locate myself in time, which can be tricky. This 2D interface, this now, is a speeding train that can be seen in different ways. Many Wednesdays look back to a single Monday, but many Fridays look back to a single Wednesday. The same light, Wednesday, looks singular when viewed from the future but myriad when viewed from the past. Who is observing the light of today? Is it the light, the crystal, at the center of my skull called the pineal gland? But my pineal gland's relative density will influence how I interpret what I see, and it will influence what I render. In other words, does light have speed or does light have density? Depends who you ask. Light that is denser than light will think light has speed. Light that is more diffuse than light will think light has density. To put it another way, ice thinks water has speed. Vapor thinks water has density. But water knows water has neither. I don't use artificial fragrance like Bounce or Glade plugins or Downy. And I don't like to be around artificial fragrance because time itself is a fragrance, and I want to be able to perceive the rate at which it dissipates. Does it dissipate too quickly, so quickly I can barely taste it? That's too much serotonin. Does it dissipate too slowly? So slowly it's as if the flavor lingers, like cheese after wine. That's dopamine. A little serotonin or a little dopamine can be great, but too much and I start to create a microclimate, a microenvironment that's giving my brain false feedback information. Too much dopamine means time is too slow. So to compensate, I start to hypermethylate. But if I methylate too quickly, I'll have too little histamine. Too much serotonin means time is too fast. So to compensate, I start to hypomethylate but when I methylate too slowly, I'll have too much histamine. The equation for time has to balance. If one side is too slow, the other side has to be too fast. People with Alzheimer's, are they understanding time properly? What if this is their ceiling and they don't realize there's all this? And what if this is their floor and they don't realize there's all this? They don't know the stationary train and they don't know all the points of the track. They only know the speeding train. For them, time is all galaxy, no quasar. They've lost their vertical axis. Their understanding of time is too flat. There are two different kinds of north. There's latitude north and altitude north. I can go from 11th street to 12th street to 13th street or I can go up in a high rise. We need to have an understanding of both kinds of north and to be able to toggle between the two the way your car's navigation system does. Over time, if I start to see north as meaning only 11th Street to 12th Street to 13th Street, I'm losing my vertical axis. I'm reading my environment as all electricity and no magnetism. I become copper toxic vitamin K toxic, and estrogen toxic. My blood can get too thick because I'm using so much copper to hold myself together. 
I don't need estrogen. I have plenty of estrogen, but I can't use it. I can't move it. I have to be able to drop my estrogen, but I can't because I'm using so much to maintain time's baseline state, my understanding of which is incorrect. Could this be involved in menopause and in Alzheimer's? If you've ever gone into labor, or even if you've just had really bad cramps, you have engaged with these background forces, the contracting force, oof, it was always there, but I don't really feel it until I'm wider than time. The expanding force, wow, it was always there, but I don't really feel it until I'm narrower than time. When I'm wider than time, my blood is effectively too thin. When I'm narrower than time, my blood is effectively too thick. There's only so much range one set of blood can hold. From here to here, great, so easy. From here to here, more difficult. From here to here, extremely difficult. The more the background force in my environment is flat, stillness, silence, darkness, the more I can establish a floor and a ceiling for time. I use sensory information to help locate myself in time. I use the perception of forces. If I wear my hair back in a tight ponytail, that's a force. If I chew on ice, that's a force. If I wear leather that was tr treated with formaldehyde, that's a force. If I drink wine, that's a strong force. Wine isn't anchored in now. Wine is anchored down here. I'm always trying to feel and to read how deep time is and how wide. Time is as wide as honey and as deep as bitter herbs. Because I'm speaking somewhat intuitively, I may not always use words correctly. I hope you can see past this and try to engage with the larger ideas. I said this talk would be about questions. So I'll end with a final question. Why do we choose to fight when we could choose to love? When we choose to love, we each do our part to repair the world. We don't see and we don't control this whole big iceberg, but we each have our own little iceberg, our own miniature universe. And it makes a huge difference when we choose to live in love. If past, present, and future are all happening simultaneously, it might seem like an odd configuration at first, but actually it's very good news. A universe is a loop of time. If ours didn't succeed, we wouldn't be here. If a universe is a loop of time, it's as if everything has already happened. The past has already happened and the future has already happened. The thing with the future is, perhaps there's more than one. Thankfully, we get to choose which future we want with our thoughts, our words, and our actions. But most of all, with our consciousness, with the thermostat that we control, that sets the climate of our inner life. For me, that's been an incredibly powerful thing, to hold within myself a loving consciousness. The pessimists and the bullies, I don't even listen to them. I just relax and keep my mind on the dream because I have a dream. Because I have a dream of a world of health and joy and freedom for everyone. A world in which we have beaten our swords into plowshares a world in which everything works together and it's all one coherent system. That's the world we're all working toward, the world we've always been working toward, even when we couldn't see it. When I fill my little iceberg with love, it aligns with the big iceberg and that's when the real magic happens. I think that's enough for today. There's more information on my website if you're interested. AlethiaBlack.com. Thank you so much for listening.